Hello, hello. I am Ro with Rose Resource Group, and I am here today with Mr. Mike, and I'm going to allow Mr. Mike to introduce himself. He is one of our convention speakers, and we're super thrilled to have him here to get a little sneak peek on what he's going to be sharing, but make sure you get your ticket so that you can come out and hear in full. So, Mr. Mike, it's a pleasure to meet you. Good morning. How are you? Good morning, Ro. I'm fine. How are you doing? Very well. And can you just give us a brief introduction? Tell us who you are and maybe you start a little bit about your homeschooling journey. Okay, sure. All right, Mike Snavely, I, I founded Mission Imperative 30 years ago. Um, I, my wife and I were actually missionaries to South Africa, where I was teaching at Durban Bible College, and she was involved in the office and the music program and so forth. We were actually headed back there um, to, to, to back into full-time work back in South Africa when the Lord used a very interesting series of circumstances to um, actually get us into a full-time ministry. It was, it, it was actually a Sunday school program. I was always interested in wildlife, nature. I mean, look, I'm in my safari stuff now, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I used to work. That. Right. I used to work for the National Park Service of South Africa and Kruger National Park was a, a goal of mine. I was always been about nature and wildlife, and I was always totally appalled when my teachers in South Africa and the public school system began to talk about evolution. Initially, I thought they were joking. I thought they were telling us a fairy tale. I found out later they were telling us a fairy tale, but I thought they were doing it as a joke because uh -huh. I could not imagine that anybody would actually believe that we, that we just got, everything just came here by random chance. I just couldn't fathom. I still can't fathom. Mm. I couldn't fathom at that time why an adult would actually believe that. So I real okay, I realize now that's all spiritual blindness and I understand all that now. Okay. But as a kid, I just didn't. I, and so I kind of I, I royally rebelled against the idea of evolution and all of that. So I was I was always into creation, always into into everything, everything from Genesis 1 to 11. I was always really interested. So um at the time we were headed back to South Africa back in the kind of early to mid-90s. Um, I was asked to teach a Sunday school class on creation versus evolution. And I remember mm -hmm. the guy who asked me to teach it said, uh, he said, we'd like you to teach it. I was all excited. I had never done anything like that before. And I said, well, give me a couple months to prepare. He said, you don't have a couple months. The class begins in two weeks. Oh, wow. So needless to say, <laughs> that was funny. Uh, partway through the class grew actually to over 200 people. Um, when that class was finished, it began to grow. Um, I began to be, I, I began to get asked to come to other churches to do similar things in their churches, not Sunday school programs, but the same sessions kind of in, 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 over the weekend. Um, it, very, it became very clear after a while that the Lord was kind of changing the direction of our ministry. So rather than going back to South Africa, we started our own ministry called Mission Imperative. And it basically was born sometime after that class when somebody said to me, you're never going to overcome the teachings of evolution. I remember saying, well, it's imperative that we at least try. Voila, mission imperative. That's mission how we want to get stuck. So, so it started off as just a, um, as a series of, uh, of meetings that we would do on the weekends, essentially. And that's how it started way back in 95. And that was the beginning of mission imperative. Mm -hmm. um, I just have to quickly highlight that sure. I love how you phrased God used a series of interest and events. Maybe this yeah. is you speaking in hindsight. I don't know if you felt like that in the moment, but I know that whenever there's a divine interruption that doesn't feel quite divine, I'm not as graceful and eloquent in how you stated it. So I just thought that was really... <laughs> well, well, thank you. I always tell kids, uh, especially kids who are coming out of college and whatnot, how do you know what the Lord's will is? How do you determine what the Lord's will is? And there's a few just simple guidelines. I always tell people, number one, make sure you are following the Lord. Make sure that you've, you've got the slate clean to make sure that, you know, you're living a life and uh, that, that is pleasing to the Lord. Make sure you're in his word as often, minimally every day. If you certainly, if you can, you need to be in his word. You need to be saturating your mind with God's word. That's the first thing. Second thing is God gave you interests and abilities and likes and dislikes for a reason. I mean, I don't like lima beans and sweet potatoes, so I stay away from them. Okay. But I do like other foods, you know, so I go toward them. God gave us interest, interest and abilities for a reason. And so I always tell people, pursue that, plan to go for that. And the, the Lord doesn't normally steer a ship that isn't moving. So get your ship moving, start moving towards your, make plans to pursue your, your passions, your interests, your goals, your likes, 
pursue that, and then the Lord can direct it. I, I enjoyed uh, teaching in South Africa. I enjoyed doing that, but it wasn't really... Um, it wasn't really what apparently I was meant to do. What I'm do, what I'm doing now is apparently what I was meant to do. And that, and the time I was in South Africa, I, I honed my teaching abilities. I didn't even know I had. So, um, so that's that's that was sort of the beginning of that. Um, and as far as my own personal homeschool journey is concerned, that's interesting because in South Africa back in the '60s and '70s, well, actually anywhere, nobody was doing homeschooling. It just wasn't a thing that was done really anywhere. But by the time we got into the 70s, there was a um, there were various universities, especially the University of Nebraska. They developed an extension division of their of the college, which was education in primary and secondary education for people who were sort of expats, like living overseas, say, say diplomats or oil oil people living in other countries they might have wanted their kids to get an american education so they established it was more correspondence school than than you would normally think of as homeschool but the education was done at home but you used a secular curriculum you had to mail in all of your your work and all that kind of stuff so actually that's how we started back in 1972 and uh, so 72 we went on correspondence from the university of nebraska and that's where i got my high school diploma from. It was a form of homeschooling even long before anyone was actually homeschooling. By the time we had our first child in 1986, um, it, it, it was getting off the ground. It was still frowned upon by a lot of people. A lot of people didn't understand it. Um, they thought, you know, you're going to stunt your kids' growth and all this stuff, you know, you know, you know all the, the things that people thought back then. But by the early 90s, I mean, it became very apparent uh, that you know, we, we could do this on our own and it was, and it was growing. I mean, it was very easy for me to take our son and say, okay, here is a marble. This is one marble. If I add another one, you have two marbles. If you add another one, it's three. If I take away one, how many do you have left? And so we're teaching simple arithmetic and we thought, yeah, you know, we teach our kids to tie their shoes and button their buttons. Why can't we teach them arithmetic and history and all that? My wife caught the bug too. And initially we didn't know what we were doing. So we kind of got a curriculum that, that covered everything, but she, she's a real, she's real thorough. And she really began to realize that our kids are all different, have different learning styles. So she very quickly began to pick and choose. And as curriculum, the companies grew as it expanded, there was so much variety out there. That was kind of our personal, my personal start to it. And then, I, and then our family, that's kind of how we got started. So you just illuminated something for me because as far back as you're sharing, there was the whole myth of, you know, your child's going to be weird. You're going to mess them up. It's not a good thing. They're going to be socially awkward and all the things. And I'm like, why is this still being perpetrated in the community? But then you said, if we can teach them to tie their shoes, why can't we teach them other things? And that's yeah. exactly the reason. We know that we're their primary teachers. I have a one-year-old. I don't say, let me get a curriculum. Let me get a book or let me send you to school to learn yeah, yeah, red. Yeah. I say, oh, look at the red ball. Look at the plane, you know, and we're their organic first and best teachers. And yeah. then all of a sudden something in our mind says, okay, get them over. You can't do it anymore. You're no longer exactly. good enough. And that's I think right. that's why they need the narrative to say, you can't do it. You're going to mess them up. For us to inhale and actually start to believe this lie that we're not good enough to teach our children yeah yeah because years later we're still hearing the same stories yeah yeah we are and and you know uh, as you would know ro education begins with the word of god i mean mm. I, I think the word of god opens our minds to origins because that's what how it begins it opens our minds to origins and purpose for existence mm. everything flows from that you know why am i here what is why why does everything in the world scream design every mm. bird every worm every every animal every tree everything screams design and so that's obvious it becomes very evident and then the the various scientific disciplines flow from that ornithology you know entomology and all this kind of stuff everything flows from that well then equally we can see another major issue in found in genesis and that's the the uh, the curse and sin 
Mm. We can plainly see, you know, animals killing each other. We take wildlife safaris to South Africa in July. Yeah. And you can plainly see that, the, you can plainly see thorns and thistles. Those are sort of practical elements, but then you see sin in humankind. You see the effects of sin. So mm. when, years ago when people would say, oh, your kids are gonna grow up to be weird by homeschooling, Oh, really? Well, kids in, you know, in, in the public school now, you know, pretend to be farm animals and little furries and going to the bathroom in, in litter boxes and stuff. Yeah, but that's not weird. Wait, 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 like, what's weird here? You know, come on. I mean, yeah. so no, yeah, so definitely everything springs from the word of God. Mm -hmm. And yes, it does take work. I, I know my wife, um, when it got into like mathematics and sciences and so forth, it, it became, she delved into it more just so she understood some of the basics. And then some of the curricula that's offered really helped to go where she couldn't, videos and things like that, could, could, to go where we couldn't go um, into some deeper things. But by that time, it had snagged in their minds and they could understand it, you know, whatever the, whatever the courses were. But yeah, no, when somebody says, oh, I can't do it anymore. Yes, you can, mm. you actually can. And that's why yeah. it's so neat with all the various helps and aids that there are today. There's so many ways to, to help you do it. Yeah. And you talked about how God is in everything and he's the originator and he's like the master builder and the original designer. And I'm so thankful that you mentioned that because a lot of times people say, I want to have a Christ-centered approach to homeschool and I want to have a biblical approach, but it's not easy for them to visualize what that looks like. So instead, what we do is we do Bible study and then we're like, check, God has been in it. Now let's go do math. When you're yeah. saying, no, 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 find God in the math. He's a God of order. Find God in the science. He's the creator. Find God in history versus yeah. let's talk about God and then now we'll do everything else. Right, right. Yeah. It's it just it it's it's like it's like your daily Bible existence becomes just that foundation for for all other all the other, you know, uh, subjects that you learn about. Yeah. Uh, years ago, I, I don't I don't even know if they're still doing this, but there was somebody who developed a, a science course. It was called um Oh, I, f I forget what it was. It was, uh, uh, anyway, it was, it was a perspective free science or something like that. I don't, it wasn't perspective free, but in other words, in other words, it was, um, it was neutral when it came to giving credit to the artist, essentially what it was. It's a perspective free science course. I'm thinking how in the world can you have that? How, when you study all of the scientific disciplines, all of the fathers and founders of every scientific discipline that there is were founded by Christians. Uh, so these, these are people who specialized in all kinds of scientific disciplines who, who knew the creator, who knew that there's, there's amazing things that he did. And so, uh, yeah, it, it, it becomes, um, it just becomes an expansion of the word of God. The more you study the word of God and then you, you study whatever science course you're, you're, you're into now, studying birds or studying frogs or whatever, it, it just becomes an extension of God's creativity and, 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 and permeates, design just permeates everything. And that's one thing that always surprised me is that the evolutionists can see design. They just don't want it to be the, this is the God, the, the God of the Bible to be the designer. They'd rather just believe evolution or or that aliens came and planted all the design, you know. All by so, chance. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned Genesis a couple of times and you talk about the origin. I know one of your sessions talks about return to Genesis. What can right. what can participants or attendees expect to hear in that? So the what what you're looking at essentially is is this particular um if, I don't know if you can see it, but this is a, a relatively new uh, uh, video that we produce called "The Return to Genesis." What that's about is it's it's not a sermon or anything. It's basically I, I give several reasons for why we need to be into the Book of Genesis because Genesis is a literal, even though even though it, it's it come it, it's not exhaustive, of course, but it is a history book. It does give us um, facts about origins, and so. In, in Genesis, we understand why things are so different today, even though we're not giving we're not given details. But for example, we know from Genesis it was probably only one continent. Now there are many. Something happened, and that would have been at the time of the flood. So that's Genesis six through nine. 
And then it used to be that um, that mankind used to live a long time. Well, we don't have the genetic ability to do that anymore. We only live about a tenth of that now anymore. Used to be that dinosaurs were on the earth and they were a specific type of reptile that has a skeletal structure so that legs come out of the bottom of their bodies. Well, they are all gone, large and small. Yet we have reptiles, large and small, that have the legs come out of the sides of their bodies. Why did one type go extinct and the other time, the other type not? So you have these little clues and very um, interesting little clues as to why the Earth was different yesterday than it is today. That's the clues are all found in Genesis, or mostly found in Genesis. And then you find um, in Genesis the reasons for. Uh, for the solidity of, of, of the book, of, of the solidity of it in our lives. Um, many people compromise today. They'll compromise by saying, oh, well, science says that the earth is billions of years old. Wrong. Science has no opinions of its own. Science is merely a tool. It has no opinions of its own. So it's wrong to say science says that. No, it's interpretation of data by an evolutionist would say the earth is billions of years old. So Christians get confused by that. And so they've come up with two different ideas. They say, well, okay, maybe there's a gap between verse one and verse two of chapter one. And maybe maybe there, maybe the earth prior to verse two was billions of years old. And so they try to accommodate what is necessary for the evolution model, billions of years, to try to accommodate that. Or another group says, well, no, it's not the gap theory. Uh, the days of creation must have been long periods of time. And so you have age number one and age number two that in which God created. And so they try to accommodate the billions of years that way. Wrong. That's not what we should be doing at all. That's just accommodating the, a world's perspective on, on the earth that is evolutionary. So this program is designed to, to give people some reasons why, some practical reasons why, they should be in the book of Genesis rather than just looking at it saying, oh yeah, that's when God began everything. No, it's not just when God began things like plants and trees and, and animals. It's also the origins of all of the major doctrines taught in the New Testament. Grace, sin, redemption, you know, all those things are greatly expanded for us in the New Testament and the origins of all of them are found in Genesis. So that's why it's, a, it's kind of a foundational course that we teach. I see. My boys and I are reading through a devotional, and what I love about it, instead of just teaching Daniel in the lion's den or Jonah in the belly of the fish, they actually point back to Jesus in every single part. So it's like yeah, they yeah. teach the shadow, but then they show you how Jesus was a part of the original story. So yeah, when I hear yeah. you talking, it actually reminds me of a conversation I had with my boys just a day or two ago. We were talking about dinosaurs, and my one of my sons said, yeah, this one looks like a rhinoceros this is the triceratops. And then one said, <laughs> this one looks like a bat or kind of like a bird. This one is the, is it pteranodon? The one that starts with a P, but the P silent. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah. Right, the pteranodon. Or, like, wow. or pteranodon, yeah. Yeah, it looks like God just created all these basic animals and then just created dinosaurs that look yeah. like ones that already existed. Varieties of, yeah, different varieties, yeah. So, some people would argue that the word dinosaur is not in the Bible and that because dinosaurs are extinct, like what is the fascination? Like, what would you say to that? So, okay. So and actually that's another one of this, the, one of the topics that I'm doing. This is our brand new one. Uh, we just finished this last year. It has some phenomenal things in which I'll mention in a moment, but um, so what would, okay, I'm sorry. The question was, what would I say about what was the ask? What was the question about dinosaurs? What is the fascination? Like, why are people still fascinated about dinosaurs for those who okay. believe in dinosaurs and for those who believe that they never existed? What oh, would you right, say right. about that? Right. Okay. So, no, they they most definitely existed. <laughs> I mean, without getting into all the details of it, yeah. yes, dinosaurs most definitely existed. It's not, some people think that they didn't because of the figment of the evolutionist imagination trying to convince us of evolution. No, that's wrong. They, mm -hmm. they are, there's nothing there's nothing fascinating about them other than the size that some of them could grow to. That's what our fascination is. Because when you look at a, an 80 foot, you know, monster walking down the, down your, the center of your town, that would, that would make a big impression on you. Oh, so yeah. the guys who originally found dinosaur bones and began to find, especially enough of them that were connected that they could see these were very large reptiles. The word dinosaur simply means terrible lizard. Because yeah. that's what they thought of when they, when they, man, these things, some of these guys were huge. Now, many yeah. of them were very small, 
but you don't go to museum to see, museums to see little chicken sized dinosaurs. You don't go see the <laughs> right. big ones. Okay. So the fascination became uh, became evident what, because we realized the size of them that some of some of them could grow to. One of the reasons why it took off so so much like it did is is because right at the around the time that the dinosaurs were discovered is when Darwin's book was coming out. So as Darwin's book hit the world and went bam, and the whole world now saw something other than creation and began to see, oh yeah, this all happened by random chance and over billions of years. Well, suddenly here's all these creatures being discovered in the ground, in the ground, and which is being interpreted as millions of years. So, that, so immediately the dinosaur issue was co-opted by the evolutionists. Now, when you hear the word dinosaur, everyone, even many Christians think, millions of years ago. It's because we're programmed from television, books, museums, everyone is programmed to think millions of years ago, and it's completely false. In fact, this video, right before we produced it, I, I was so honored to finally get permission right before it was produced. I could literally edit in some very important things at the end of it. It has some, some very shocking revelations about the existence of dinosaurs. Number one, Dr. Mark Armitage has done some amazing uh, uh, videos sh under a microscope showing stretchy uh, nerves, stretchy tendons, stretchy um, like bone cells under a microscope from creatures supposedly from the Permian. Ro, that's like supposedly 300 million years old. I mean, this is impossible. You cannot still have stretchy material that he can literally take in a microscope and you can see it stretching or bending. You can't have something like that last 65 million to 300 million years old. You're totally fooling yourself if you think it's, it's gonna last that long. But furthermore, something that was astounding, he discovered in almost every bone he was looking at and they can shave them down to a width of about 1 30th, the width of a human hair in virtually everyone. And this was just a new discovery as he was coming, as we were coming out with our our, our video last year, and apparently it's, it's going on all the time. In every one of them where there's still bone that they can shave, every one of them, you can see the spaces where blood flowed, they're all clotted. They are all clotted, they're all ringed with black, and the black is clotted blood cells, which only happens when the creature asphyxiates by drowning. Go figure. The wow. Global, that is astounding. Plus then you have in there, I, I show, um, there's a whole segment about proving that dinosaurs did live with people. And I show petroglyphs and things like that of very clear carvings of dinosaurs that people would have, would have had to have seen to carve them, right? But one of the most fascinating ones is a, is a, is a painting that I, that I show in there. It's, it was painted in 1562, I think, 1562 or 1652, I forget what, by Peter Bruegel the Elder. In other words, it way predated Darwin, way predated evolution, right? In his painting called The Suicide of Saul, you're seeing this whole army and off in the distance, there's a river. And across the river, the army is on the move. There's at least three large sauropod dinosaurs that are being ridden by people. This painting was done long before Darwin. So, so you have evidence that dinosaurs have lived with people and they did not die out 65 million years ago and all of that. So there's a very biblical answer to, to, to all, this, all the this stuff about dinosaurs. And, I, and it, it's, it's very clear. But yeah, so they were made on day six with, with people and they lived with people for 1,656 years until the time of the flood. And they never, they never ruled the earth like we're told that job was given by man. Right. To do. So yeah, so there is definitely some fascinating things with dinosaurs, and I'll be doing that program um, at the at the convention too. I was going to ask you to spell something out, but you kind of tied it together. But I'll still give you an opportunity. You said there was a blood clot, and it was black, and that signifies that they're drowned. And then right at a couple of seconds ago, you you kind of tied it together. Can you spell it out for anyone who's missing? Tell me about this drowner. What does that mean? What are you getting at? T tell me about the what? The drowning. The drowning. Okay, so so um, blood will clot like this. Now I, yeah. I'm 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 not a doctor. I I didn't even know this until I saw this. But he is. He he knows exactly what he's talking about. When when any creature drowns, when they asphyxiate by drowning, they 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 panic. Their blood begins. 
means to clot in the place of he called it bleeding out the other way. I don't even know what all that means, but you can reverse the process when somebody is safe. But mm -hmm. blood immediately begins to clot in all of the vessels. So when you shave the vessel, when you shave the bone in which the vessels are have been have been encapsulated, it's not going to soft tissue won't won't fossilize. So right. these bones, okay. So when you shave them, all the blood vessels that you can see or places where the blood had flowed are all lined or sometimes completely choked with black which yeah. means the black parts are blood clots, which means the creature died by asphyxiation, which in the case of a dinosaur, everyone that they're finding with, with they have, has this clotting, which means they all died in the flood, in the, in the flood of Noah's time. No, it's, yeah. That's where they died. We've always known that. Yeah. There's now physical proof from their bodies, from their bones. Yeah. I wanted to make sure it didn't go over anyone's head. The flood people, Noah's Ark and the flood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the global flood. It's actually not Noah's flood, it's God's flood. But it, God's flood, flood, sorry. Noah's, yeah, right, right. <laughs> Thank so, you. All right, yeah. so then another one of your sessions is the lost secrets to civilization. Right, lost secrets of ancient civilization. So that's one that we usually use to wrap up a, a series that we're doing because it show, it's from Romans 1. And from Romans 120, which is our ministry verse, it talks about the evidence of God by, by looking at through, through what he had made. But um, the, the ancient civilization one has two parts. It shows what mankind being made in the image of God was able to accomplish. Mankind mm -hmm. was able to accomplish astounding things in the past because we're made in God's image. We are we are creative, we're inventive, right. we're, we're, we're problem solvers. You know, that's what that's the way God made us. So he put us on this earth and he, he just wanted us to figure it out, dig out stuff, make, mm -hmm. make, make uh, rings, you know, make, make things for, make musical instruments, make things out of wood, just because we figure things out. So in the past, and in fact, till now too, mankind has been able to accomplish great things at the peak of every, of every civilization. And in fact, since that's been going on since the beginning of time, when we find things that are not only supposedly very old but also very technologically advanced this becomes immediately a cause of concern for an evolutionist because they don't know how somebody that long ago right. could have known these very technologically advanced things because they they, they think oh we're, we're coming from an ape man stage so if you go mm -hmm. back to the stone age supposedly you know we're we're slowly evolving into humans and all that kind of stuff so that was just that's that's their perspective no uh it, and and many of them will say well it must be aliens that came down here you know, so they relegated it all to alien so we show no this is just evidence of god's design but then that's the first part of that program is to show the evidence of god's design the second part of the program is to show the decline of civilization mm -hmm. according to romans one and i've drawn it as a series of steps and and the verses take you right through those steps and the whole point is to illustrate when you when you see these steps down and every one of them is defined for us it starts by knowing god and then mm -hmm. it goes downhill from there to total societal chaos and then my challenge to people is look at the stairway where is the united states or whatever country you live in where is your country on that stairway yeah and it becomes it becomes very obvious where where we are, and mm -hmm. so um, the whole the whole challenge to us is to look. We we you know we we we've got to stop playing around with 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 the world. We have to stop you know taking our mindset and bending it to fit the world and to please mm -hmm. the world and all of that. We've got to stop doing that. So yeah. this is a challenge to us to take the word of God seriously. You've been given a life. Are you using it? for your own pleasure, for your own, whatever you're using it for, for your own gain or whatever, or are you making a difference while you're alive for God's kingdom? Essentially, that's mm -hmm. what that program is about. And that graphic that you mentioned with the staircase starting from knowing with God, where can that be found? Well, that's from Romans 1, and then it starts from Romans 1, 21. Romans mm -hmm. 1, 20 is kind of the pinnacle verse there. It talks about the evidence of God's design so that mankind's without excuse. Then from 21 on to the end of the chapter, it just, it's, 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 it, it's, it's like a stairway. I've drawn it as a stairway so you can kind of picture it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's what that is. Do you have that actual image in any of your literature? I do. I do. It's, do? A, it's on that. It's on the program that I do. In fact, the whole last, last half, we, we, as we read that scripture, you see the stairway building. Oh, perfect. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I'm so curious about so much, but I don't want to give away too much. So I will ask you for some final thoughts. And one question before that is, as you've studied and learned so much about creation versus evolution, 
what is like your favorite myth buster or like what do you find the most fascinating you can answer one or both oh man my favorite myth buster oh, i know man. it's a tough one <laughs> There's a lot of, okay, okay, we just mentioned some of them with the dinosaurs, right? Okay. okay so those, are, those are huge myth busters. Mm -hmm. um, another one, another one um, I guess to me is one that I cover in a program called the Pillars of Evolution, and I have DVDs for, for most of these, uh, is, is the whole idea of the human cell or any, actually of any, the cell of any living thing. Because in a human, let's just take a human now, in the cell, they used to call it the simple cell. They don't call it the simple cell anymore. They now know that in every single human cell, it is just as complex as an entire city like New York or Philadelphia. Wow. Every single cell of, and you have something like a hundred trillion of them. A hundred trillion New Yorks in you. That is phenomenal to me that there's that much detail. So when you delve into it, you, you'd say, when you look at a city like New York, you would say, okay, am I seeing just building materials? Am I seeing just stacks of glass, stacks of brick, stacks of pipe, stacks of wire? No, you're seeing them all assembled in a, in a meaningful, purposeful, orderly way to build a city. Mm -hmm. But you'd have to ask yourself a question. Even if you did see the piles of building material, you'd have to ask yourself, wh who gathered the right building materials? Where go. did the correct building materials come from, let alone being put in a meaningful way? That's right. the main problem that evolution has to answer, one of the two main ones that evolution has to answer. Where, where did all of the complex materials come from? Who assembled them? And how did it all get built into a structure like a, like a city? Number one. Number two, what made it alive? Mm. Because all, all evolutionists can do is say, is try to explain uh, um, complexity. Where did yeah. increased complexity come from? But that still doesn't make it alive. And so scientists do not know what life is. The only, the only place you can find the origin of life is the Bible, when it talks mm -hmm. about, I am the way, the truth, and life, right. and so forth. So yeah. life is only defined as being something that Jesus Christ has. It's the essence of his being that he essentially loans to us. Those are two big kind of myth, uh, myth busters as far as the you know, dinosaurs and then the, then the cell. There's, there's others, I guess, too, but uh, those are two that I would, I would definitely... <laughs> definitely um, go with right away. Those are so fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing. I am looking forward to attending some welcome. of your sessions. One of the things with CHAP is that they have so many amazing sessions and I'm like, which one do I choose? I want to go to oh, all of them at the same time. I know. And the other one I'm doing is the one on the Grand Canyon. Yes. Which is a fascinating, that. fascinating look at a feature of our world that everybody looks and goes, oh, what a, what a nice, what an incredible hole. And then all of the signs say, oh yeah, millions of years of Colorado River. Baloney, this is, this is, <laughs> this is why we take a, a trip there every fall, every November. We take, a, uh, we take a group of about 40 people for a 10 day trip called the Southwest Safari because it is the world's best classroom for evidence for a global flood and its aftermath. When the flood ended, there were many post-flood catastrophes that as the earth was settling down that happened. The, to produce the look of the way the planet is today. And they're still going on today. Earthquakes and volcanoes and all that are all directly related to the flood. But that area literally is the best evidence for, uh, for the global flood on the planet. And so it's amazing. It's amazing to see. So that's just one feature we like to talk about. So yeah, we're doing the Grand Canyon one as well. Thank you so much. This has been so fascinating and it really inspires me as a homeschool mom to teach history the way you've showed it. So instead of saying, what are the seven continents? What are they called? You know, like really showing, like you said, return to Genesis. Do you know yeah. why we have seven continents? Do you think we had seven continents in the Bible? When, yeah, you know, yeah. and really having them expand their mind. So yeah. thank you for that inspiration. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me, Ro. I appreciate it. It has been my pleasure. Thank you so much. All right.